What is up hobby friends? In this video, I'm gonna be doing a mixed how-to and showcase video for my modular subway board that I built for Marvel Crisis Protocol. Hey. The actual inspiration for the board came from Rob Hawkins' Gen Con display. So Atomic Mass commissioned a subway board from him back in 2019 as a demo and showcase for their new game, Marvel Crisis Protocol. And it was a New York subway board, fixed layout, but it looked fantastic. It had a lot of these scatter elements like pillars that could be removed and diamond for gameplay. Um, you had train tracks with trains that could move along. You had uh, escalators in the middle of the board that just made the thing feel like a real subway. And I wanted to capture that with my own board as well. And I also wanted to steer clear of doing an urban uh, cityscape, at least for my first board, just to have something a little different. So the planning of the board itself was actually pretty straightforward, I think. I basically used Illustrator to map out the different kinds of configurations and layouts I could possibly have. And then I worked backwards to figure out how many pieces I would need to be able to achieve different kinds of layouts I was trying to accomplish. In thinking about the, the modular board, Marvel's played on a three foot by three foot board. However, because I am making it modular and I wanna have a flexibility in, in the layout, I'm going to end up making some extra pieces. So I think the total amount of board sections I'm going to make will end up being able to create a, a four by three board. So you can see here on the screen that I basically have a couple of layout mockups and this was to figure out the um, the amount of sections I would have to make of each type, either flat platform or platform and rail, to allow for the greatest flexibility in terms of layouts. So I ended up creating each section in a six inch by 12 inch board. And what this will allow me to do is um, mix and match and have a couple of fairly generic um, shapes that be used to create narrow platforms, wide platforms, um, a platform with a single rail, a uh, platform with double rail, and sort of everything in between. And so there's only really three uh, primary board pieces that we're going to be making. There's going to be the 6x12 platform that's going to sit on the edge. So these will have flush edges with a backboard on one side to demarcate the edge of the board. And I'm also going to be pegging these to basically allow me to secure all the different board sections. So um, having that as one type of piece. The next is um, a non-table edge 6x12 wide platform, um, basically used to, to fill the gaps and create um, wider platforms or to allow uh, the filler in between a platform and then a rail. And then finally, we're going to have a narrow platform with a rail section. So the platform itself will now be three by 12, so half of the actual section and the other half will be the rail. Having the rail open on one side will allow me to either close it off with another platform piece or to adjoin it with a second rail to do a, um, a double wide train section between platforms. So once I have all the pieces required and I've figured out all the different layouts I potentially wanna make, I can then count, okay, how many base sections I need, how many wide platforms, how many narrow platforms. So essentially we're doing 24 base sections um, and then 12 and 12, so 12 would be wide, six for the edges and six for the centers, and then six narrow platforms that will have rail sections adjoined to them. And then I can map out um, exactly how many sheets of MDF board I'm going to need to pick up. Something I also had to account for as well was how I was going to store the board. So you can see behind me this, um, I don't know what you call it, it's not, it's not a Tupperware bin, but it's like a storage bin, it's plastic. Um, it's about 25 inches long, wide. I think it's 17, 16 inches deep and 15 inches tall. And this will allow me to basically uh, lay out and have the entire board sections or all the components in that one box along with any sort of extra debris, uh, the trains I'm gonna build, um, things like stairwells or, or pillars, whatever. I'll be able to fit in this one box. I can store it, it'll be portable, and more importantly, it can be stackable. So speaking briefly to the approach of the way I uh, constructed these boards, as I mentioned before, I'm 
looking to have one durability and also some weight to them. I think each of these probably ends up being about um, a half pound to a pound. I haven't actually um, measured it, but the, the intention being that I want this entire board to, to feel substantial and then not be pushed around as easily. So if you accidentally bump it, if something um, like a book or a dice tray or whatever knocks up against some of the edges, it's not gonna push the entire board because once everything's together, you're probably looking at like um, 30 to 40 pounds of uh, board on the table. So I think it worked very, very well. Basically it's a top and bottom. The bottom of each board is always gonna be a six by 12. So you can put them together six by three to create your three by three board. And then the tops will vary depending on whether it's a wide platform, which is another six by two um, with an inset on both sides, a uh, wide platform that goes on an edge. So it's also six by 12, but one of the sides is flush and that's going to be the edge of the board. Or it's a narrow platform with a train rail. So this is a three by 12 with an inset on both sides and then a three inch corridor for the train. So this way I know when I build my trains, I'm gonna be aiming for about just a little narrower than three inches. So probably two, um, 2.85 or 2.8 inches, for the width of the train. And that'll have the, the room for the train to ride along the rail uh, with a bit of wiggle room without being too snug. So the first thing that I had to basically figure out or um, create was a jig. So something that I gave a, a think over was how to basically line up all the different edges to get flush cuts and to create consistent insets for all the platforms. So, so this is my uh, six by 12. So essentially the board will be made up of um, 18 of these laid out, so three by three. So you have three wide, six deep. And you'll have 18 of them. So each of these will either have a wide platform, it'll be an edge platform or a rail. We're gonna have the three quarter inch strips to create the depth. So if it's an edge piece, one side will be flush, one side will have the inset so that where the rail sits, you're, you're gonna have that undercut. So on top of that, if this is gonna be an edge piece, I need to have a, another six by 12. Or if it's going to be a, a small platform, we're going to need a three by 12. So I need to figure out a way to basically consistently get either a flush edge or create a consistent inset to allow for all the board sections to line up and, and sit flush. So I used some extra pieces and one of these, um, I don't know what you call them, right angle, triangle, whatever things. Um, and I ended up doing three pieces to create my, my 90 degree corner. So this will then allow me to basically flush screw in my uh, edge pieces. I also created a, an inset jig to be able to consistently create a, uh, an inset for any of the board edges that are expected to sit along the rail. Basically this will allow me to consistently um, screw in and create that inset for every single piece very, very quickly. So what we're going to be doing now is actually putting together all the different components. So we're going to have to create six edge platforms that are six by 12. We're gonna to have to create six inner platforms, uh, also six by 12. And then we're gonna be creating uh, 12 rail sections that are half platforms, three by 12 with an open space for the rail. So it is now quarter to nine. I have been working away at this for, I wanna say like six hours now. I, I started probably around um, 1 30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I took a bit of a break around 6 30, um, 6 o'clock. Walk the dog, get some dinner, take a bit of a break. So, pretty continuous, but um, I've now gotten all of the boards and pieces basically all screwed together, put together, and you can see how I intend to organize it in the cabinet. So, to make the rails, we're using a couple of pre-cut plastic card strips. And then I'm using some thin rod that I'm gonna be slicing up to make the rivets. And there's really three components. So there's the rivets using the rods, there's the actual rail itself, 
And then I don't know what you call these, but they're the little bars that are used to actually uh, secure or nail the rail down to the ground. So we're using 24 inch of these thin strips for the rails. Let's cut them in half so they're 12 inches each. And we have, because we're making 12 boards, I need two rails for each board, so 24 of them. I've then taken these wider strips and I've cut them into, I believe they're quarter inch uh, little segments right here. And I've cut enough in this little container uh, to make 24 of these. So I've spaced them out so they're evenly spaced. So all we're doing is we're just using this little jig. I've made a, uh, a spacing jig with some spare plaster card and we're going to be able to use this to quickly space out and glue in each of these segments. So using this jig, I'm able to very quickly uh, space out the division between each of the, the segments. And then using some tweezers and some plastic glue, and drop it in. Move the jig and attach the next piece. And that's pretty straightforward. It doesn't take long for each individual piece, but because I'm doing this, or I will be doing this 24 times, it is going to add up. The hard part is what comes next. So using an X-Acto blade, I've essentially taken this rod and I've cut it into tiny little, not strips, but tiny little pieces to form the rivet. So I've already pre-cut a whole bunch of them. Um, I expect that I probably will have to cut some more using the rod here. And much like adding or gluing in the, uh, the strip segments, we're just doing the same thing with the tweezers, grabbing each individual rivet, dabbing it onto the plastic glue brush, and then placing it. And we're just doing this for every single rivet along the way. So I think today is day four, and we're gonna be working on the escalators today. So step one, I've basically mapped out how I want to do the actual escalators in terms of dimensions, the parts I'm going to need, the materials. And to make the rails, we're going to actually be using plaster card with the cry cut. So essentially, I'm using 0.4 millimeter because it's the easiest one that cry cut will cut nice and quickly. And we're stacking six, six sheets of them to make each rail. So I've got to cut uh, 18 of these sheets to make enough to stack uh, 12 rails. So basically, once I've got the vector done in Illustrator, we save out an SVG, load it into the CryCut Maker, uh, the CryCut Design Space, lays it up very, very easily, and we're able to just print this out. It takes about uh, three minutes, four minutes to make one sheet. So probably in about an hour, hour and a half time, we'll have all the sheets cut out, glued together, and then we can start uh, cutting the side panels and the steps for the escalator. So using the table saw, I basically cut out, uh, for the escalators, 72 of these 1 inch by 1.25 inch uh, steps, essentially. I've beveled one end so that when they get staggered, uh, much like the escalator, they have that um, staggered cut to them. I think it just adds a little bit of extra detailing so that um, the angle just makes it feel like an escalator rather than stairs. Because we are going to also be doing stairs, I've cut out uh, 24, uh, 1.5 by 1 inch uh, squares because they're not going to have the escalator uh, handrails. And these are just uh, straight cut because they're going to be just typical steps. Each stairwell will have 12 of these squares cut together. And basically, I'm using a jig to offset them by about a quarter inch for every single step. And this just helps to make it uh, easier to assemble. I can do the, the height adjustment very, very quickly and very consistently. And all we're doing is we're just going step by step and gluing them in one at a time. I'm just using basic super glue because these are going to be sandwiched in between thicker, uh, larger MDF boards and they're not gonna be super handle, we're not gonna expect models to be sitting on top of them. 
I'm not too worried about too much pressure being placed on the steps. Otherwise, I might use something like wood glue. It would take a lot longer to dry. You'd probably want to have to figure out a way to clamp them, uh, but you would end up with a sturdier bond. But I think for the purpose that we're using these for, just as pure display and for uh, terrain blocking, I think just using super glue to attach them, and it should be sufficient. Just have to make sure that when you are letting the pieces dry, that it does take about a minute or two for the super glue to fully uh, cure or bond between the two sheets of MDF board. So once you've got them glued in, don't touch it, just let them cure. I'm also applying the super glue not anywhere close to the edge. It's still going to form a decent bond, but when the two sheets compress, it is going to uh, push the super glue up towards the edges. And I want to make sure that it doesn't. Uh, drip over the edge or more importantly attach itself to the backboard so the final stage of detailing the handrails of the escalators is to actually do the uh, the rubber part of the handrail the first thing i've done is taken a dental tool with just a sharp pointed end and at one inch intervals I've scored and creased the inside of the stairs so that it will have a bit of this uh, metallic plate texture just to add a little bit of detail. I then cut two millimeter strips of plastic card, taking great care to score it a few times before cutting through. Because we're cutting it so thin at on point four millimeter plastic card, if you try and do it in one cut, it curves from the pressure and it bows. So, the best way to do it is just to gently score it and do four or five gentle cuts until it cuts nice and evenly. The width of this sheet, or these six plastic guards um, sheets put together, is just a touch under three millimeters. So two millimeters should leave a bit of a lip on both sides. And when we're done, we're going to end up with something like this. So it ends up being or covering up the six stacks of plastic card that we have to make the depth of this and also the inset makes it look like there is a rubber handrail running along the surface. So to glue this in we're going to be using uh, plastic glue and it's just a matter of working section by section gently pressing down and giving the plastic card a couple of seconds to cure. As we lay it down, we want to make sure that we're leaving that inset on both sides. Make sure that you cut a plastic card strip long enough to wrap all the way around and wrap underneath the bottom. It's going to stick out a bit, but that's fine. Once we let the super or the plastic glue uh, cure a bit on the plastic card, we're just going to take a sharp knife and we're going to trim the bottom. And then we're going to go ahead and set this aside uh, for a couple of hours, let this fully cure. And then we're going to go back in with sandpaper round out the edges so it's not so sharp, and then we'll file this smooth as well. The way I'm going to texture and add detail with the tiling and on the walls is I'm going to try and minimize the amount of painting I'm going to be doing on the board. One, for time, and two, I think it's something that I was experimenting with within some of my previous display boards and that worked really, really well, was actually creating a digital texture and then printing it. So for the uh, floor tiles especially, what I'm gonna be doing is printing up a, a graphic image that I'll be making in Photoshop onto some thick cardstock that I can then score and crease to give the illusion of tile. I'll do a few coats of Mod Podge on top just to give it a bit of a gloss, probably use some oils and weathering powders to um, add some grit to it and just a little bit more of that uh, damaged or worn texture, I don't know, whatever you describe it. 
um, just to make it feel a little bit like it was was painted, but it really isn't. And we'll do the same thing for the walls. And this will allow me to quickly and efficiently detail the board without actually getting in and trying to hand paint everything or try and airbrush everything. So I've gone ahead with um, the two programs, Photoshop and Illustrator, and I've created graphics for all of the different elements of the board. So we have the floor tiles for our wide platform and our narrow platform. And you'll also see that I've put in a little bit of extra bleed. It's always important when creating graphics, um, especially with this technique, that you want to create that bleed space. <laughs> yeah. You want to create that bleed space or that overprint to allow you to be able to close crop um, or to just cut without um, missing any of that print work. So you can see that I've done a bit of a, a mock-up or a test just to make sure that the cardstock um, it will adhere well. I haven't used this particular Mod Podge before. It's a bit more of a matte finish. Um, although having done a few coats, there is a bit of a, a luster to it, which actually I'm kind of liking. In the right light, it reflects a little bit and gives the illusion of something of a shiny tile. So what I did was I just trimmed two halves. Um, I applied Mod Podge underneath, which is essentially like um, PVA glue. So it helps to adhere the paper to the board. And then I went back over on top and applied a few coats of Mod Podge just to seal the surface so that it's not quite that paper texture. Um, it'll hold up well to when I apply the weathering powders and mineral spirits to fix. Um, if I have to apply any oils or whatever on top, it has that um, finish on top where the paper won't just absorb um, whatever material I put on top. So to trim everything, we're just using our standard X-Acto blade. Now you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have uh, quite a few spare blades, keep them nice and sharp to get really nice clean cuts. If you're gonna be doing any scoring, you wanna be using a scoring tool. So I've got my trusty Swiss Army knife, which I've bought ugh, decades ago. And it's got two scoring surfaces, one sharp or one fine and one thicker, coarser. So depending on if I want to score some of the tiles um, or indent some details, I can use those. And then to apply our Mod Podge, I've got this big tub right here just to guarantee I don't run out. So we're using Mod Podge with a matte finish, but it comes in um, a variety of styles. You can get gloss, you can get satin, um, you can get a hard coat, which is glossy, but much more durable. Depends on what you want for the overall finish. It's essentially like PVA glue, um, but it dries um, much clearer. I find it's a nicer material to use. It's much more durable and it's water-based. So you can wash it with water when you're using an old brush, which we'll be applying. I've got a thin brush here and a larger, thicker brush here, which we'll just be using to apply our Mod Podge. So with the board itself and some of the larger pieces of terrain, like pillars and stairs out of the way, it was time to tackle a lot of the smaller scattered terrain. So things like benches, newsstands, ticket booths, vending machines, um, billboards, and even the trains themselves. I ended up 3D printing all of it, rather than do it by hand. And a large reason for this and why I picked up the 3D printer was being able to mass produce identical objects very, very quickly and easily. In the past, I'd always resorted to using plastic card to make things myself. And it's not that it's difficult, it's like you can do it pretty, pretty easily. The challenge becomes in the mass production of it. So for example, in the, the benches, right? So I made 16 benches with the 3D printer, it's as easy as just taking the SCL file, duplicating it 16 times, and then you know, like eight hours later, we're good to go. If I were to do it by hand, doing 16 is a lot of work, and there's no guarantee that I can produce them all the same way to the same quality without going crazy. So I ended up 3D printing a lot of it just to save my sanity. And then this allowed me to spend time on what I wanted to do, which was actually painting it and getting it board ready. If you watched my new stand video, the way I painted them was pretty straightforward. Um, using a simple two-tone airbrush base coat and highlight, I pick out some details in the case of vending machines and like the new stand or whatever. And then I relied heavily on oils and enamels to do the heavy lifting. When graphics were required, rather than freehand anything, I would just um, print off graphics from, from staples 
and then I would cut it and glue it to shape. So the billboards, vending machines, newspapers, things like that, that was all done by print. And that let me get a pretty, pretty good photo finish without any effort. And I think it looks phenomenal. And it was a good balance of speed in terms of the effort that I would have to put in um, versus how good I could get it looking in front of the camera. I did run into some problems with the 3D printing. And this was largely because I was still learning how to use the printer. And some of the things that I hadn't quite figured out when I started working on the board were hauling up my prints and creating drain holes to drain the resin. And then not needing infills. I thought I would need more of it, but because we're not relying on these prints to be, um, I don't want to say structurally sound, but they're not like load bearing. I don't need them to take weight in any way, shape or form. And leaving a print hollow with no supporting infill, as long as the walls were thick enough, was completely sufficient. So my initial batch of prints for the scatter terrain ended up not taking any of this into account. And if you follow my social uh, media platforms on Instagram, particularly, you'll know that a lot of my original prints, like the vending machines and even some of the benches have just exploded. Um, the resin inside caused the, um, the cured resin to crack and essentially over time, these things just split and destroyed themselves. So I ended up having to basically segue for a week, a uh, week and a half to reprint all of um, the vending machines, the ticket booths, even the new stand roof. I had to reprint like four times because it kept cracking no matter how I set the drain holes or infills. And I ended up on the final version just printing the damn thing solid. So that was actually a really big frustration of mine. And moving forward, I'm going to have to print a lot of my important pieces as just solid. So the original intent was to, to hand make them using the crack cut and plaster card. And so I started off using some cardstock um, paper craft models just to get a sense of the size and the scale and to also get the board playable, just having a couple of terrain uh, pieces on the board while I worked on everything else to really get a sense of playability and to really think through how I was going to tackle building the trains. And taking the blueprints off of actual subway trains they end up being quite long, um, longer than you can reasonably expect to fit on a board and still make them playable. And so the original concept had them marked down to about uh, 10 inches, I think this is. Very much condensed. It's like a, almost like a toy train. Um, most of them would usually be about two or three times as long, but that would take up most of the board and block too much line of sight. Really just be unplayable. Um, this is also a good way for me to mock up general proportions in terms of the width and the height um, and eventually whenever I got around to building it I would be able to have a greater sense of how I wanted to, to actually build the things. So life got in the way and I ended up dragging my feet for probably about two two and a half months from when I started the board and at the point now where I want to just get this done and so rather than make them out of plastic card, which just in terms of cost and material would end up costing as much as it would to print one of these things anyways. I just bit the bullet and I'm like, you know what, fuck it. I'm not gonna build a working interior anyways. Why spend all that time trying to, to finagle and make all these different parts, especially having the depth of the front and back with the inset doors, all the window frames, the inset side doors, the curved roof. I'm like, you know what, fuck it. I bought the subway pack from Corvus Games Terrain anyways, and they had a 3D model for it. So I adjusted the proportions and the size for something more suitable for my board um, in particular, and I printed it up. So I ended up printing four of these halves to allow me to build a full train. So you can see that they're quite a bit longer. These are about 16 inches and maybe a little, a little shorter. They're about a half inch shorter. Um, this was mainly because when I printed it, um, I had to get it to fit on the print bed. And if I stretched it too tall, the doors would be too thin and too tall. Um, this would end up being just out of proportion. And so I scaled it down a little for the aesthetics. It's not terrible. It's a little off, I think, in terms of the scale. But a little bit of abstraction is okay. It's more about balancing the aesthetics of it along with the playability. When I had 
started printing these, my original intent was to also uh, join them together and then use Bondo or some sort of sculpting material to fill in the gaps and create one long train. However, once I printed them and the combination of the weight and just getting a sense of the actual full size of the entire thing put together, I decided to leave them separate. Part of this is just the transportation of it. Um, I, 16 inches, the, the resin is probably combined, I'd say about five, six pounds. And I worry that um, I could pin to uh, increase the joint strength. Um, but if I just glue it and use Bondo, I'm worried that it'll snap just from, from being transported, potentially bouncing around. Um, fully put together, it is also 16 inches long, which is a little unwieldy to transport, especially when most of the boards are, or most parts of the board in the case are probably, um, they're 12 by six and there's not a lot of, of wiggle room to store a full uh, 14 inch train, especially once you account for the fact I'm gonna have the wheels on there, makes it very, very awkward. Additionally, on the table, keeping them separate allows me to put them on the end of a track on a board edge and have half a train peeking through. And being able to do this with all four parts gives me just that little bit of extra flexibility and then just makes it much easier to, to manage. So the original model itself comes with a base. So it's a panel that sits under here and it has a bit more depth with the wheels built in. Because I did end up stretching the proportions of this, if I printed up that to match the proportions of the base, the wheels wouldn't be circular, which in and of itself, not a big deal. Um, the wheels are hidden by the tracks anyways and the sides. However, I also had to account for the fact that I was using my own custom rails for this with its own custom width and height in terms of the platform. Because Corvus has um, built this model, the base with the wheels all to match its own tracks and platform heights, I needed something a little bit more bespoke and custom to fit my own table. So I found these free train track wheels on Thingiverse, printed up a whole bunch of them, and I ended up using plastic card to create the extra height I needed to be able to secure the wheels to the train themselves. And you can see I left them hollow, and that's mainly because I just don't need to waste the material. Once they're glued on and once the train is on the track, you don't even notice that it's hollow. So this was more just a way for me to save costs and build them up very quickly and easily. In terms of next steps and what I have planned in the future for this board, I have a few ideas for other scatter terrain and smaller elements I want to add, things that could potentially be interchanged between my different Marvel boards. So probably in the new year when I start working on my urban Marvel board, I'll be able to have more elements that can be used back and forth interchangeably between these two boards. I think I also want to go back in, maybe print up another train or two, and then add in some graffiti and a little more wear, just thematically as I play more games with it and as my own internal narrative develops, just to add a little bit more color and flavor to my boards. But for the time being, I have a lot of other projects, in particular a huge backlog of Marvel miniatures to paint through, so for the time being, I'm just calling this board done. So that's it for this video. Thanks for checking it out. I hope you found it inspirational and maybe you'll draw some insights or knowledge for when you want to build your own modular board. If you want to check out my other social media platforms where I'll be spamming lots of photos of my subway board, I'll make sure I'm pointing up. I'll make sure to drop links in the description below. And as always, until next time, happy hobbying.